I'm very honored to be here. Uh, look forward to the next hour. Here to talk about Asian companies being successful in the U.S. Um, these pictures may look a little familiar to you. Uh, this past weekend, I helped my older son move into his apartment at UC Santa Barbara. And suddenly I looked around his room and I said, my goodness, most of these products in this room, or at least many of these products in this room, look like they came from Asia. And then, by the way, I went back to my hotel room where the other pictures are from and said the same thing. There's actually two items in these pictures that, uh, believe it or not, were built in the United States. And as I go around, there's a computer, microwave, toaster, a bunch of tools, table, desk, more tools, lamp, bicycle, pens, uh, lamp, laundry bin, desk, heater, uh, whatever, fan, uh, radio, phone, more stuff, uh, sunglasses, TV. It's pretty amazing. The world has changed a lot. I know when I was your age, maybe one or two items in those photos would have come from Asia, and now it's the other way around. So when we talk about enablers to success, um, so the first one is certainly to have a really understanding of being successful in the United States, it's basically marketing 101, really understand the behaviors of your customers. What are their preferences? Uh, what drives the US buyers? Whether it's a consumer buying something directly from a business or it's a business buyer buying from another business, you really have to understand what motivates them. And we're gonna talk through that list of what those things are. Second, there needs to be a speed strategy, and this is not often talked about because most people, uh, even in industry and especially in universities, don't really understand a lot of the operational systems, uh, production systems that have gone into existence, especially in the last 10, 15 years, that are frankly superior to what has existed traditionally over the last 80 years. And what I can tell you, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, those systems are all based about speed getting your product to market earlier than the other person, not just by a few days, not by just a few weeks, but months or years. Um, and then once you're in production, again, repeatedly operating with shorter lead times, quicker inventory terms. So again, you can be more responsive to the ever-changing needs and tastes of your customers. Now, by the way, that is a very serious problem and challenge for Asian manufacturers trying to produce products for the US market. And we'll talk about how some of them have actually solved it and it's solved it quite well. Um, and of course, you have to have the right frame of mind. Um, it's all about learning and listening. We'll finish on that. You know, how do you really listen and pay attention to what people want? Um, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, if you're not humble and, and have a lot of perseverance in succeeding, uh, no individual or company is ever going to get to where they want to go. Uh, one thing that's very interesting about what I've come to believe about American culture when it comes to our elected officials, we're pretty interesting. We'll elect what I call style over substance. We don't care what the person's talking about, but if they look good and they make us feel comfortable, we'll elect them. But when it comes to products, Americans tend to be much more serious than that. We tend to operate on substance over style. And we may get fooled a little bit, but after a while, we don't get fooled repetitively. So it's a very interesting dynamic amongst American consumers. So here's my list. It's not the only list, but this is the way I tend to look at how and what drives American buyer behavior. I'm not going to read every one of them, and we're going to talk about each one of them in more detail. The first one is U.S. nationalism, and I think there's a big misnomer here. Americans basically don't care where the item comes from. Um, very interesting culture we have. Um, if the product works, if it does what we hope it's going to do, We'll buy it, and we don't care where it came, who made it, and where you know, and and uh, who designed it, who built it, who shipped it. Now, there's of course exceptions to that, and that's really kind of an interesting history for us. So the exceptions are fairly significant. If you go back to the 40s, uh, one thing that's really amazing about American culture: here we fought in a major, in in a huge war. Uh, both in, in Europe and in the Pacific. And of course, the exceptions are if you were an American soldier and you fought in either theater, the chances of you buying a German product, probably for the rest of your life or a Japanese product, if you were in combat, it's probably pretty slim to none. Um, yet, 
If you may have been served and maybe you were in a backwater area, you didn't necessarily face combat, most people who were not really exposed to war tend to have much shorter memories. And that's pretty much true universally. It doesn't matter what conflict we've had. Americans, because we haven't had wars on our soil, tend to not think that way, don't have long memories. Uh, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. She, to the day she died, she would never buy a German product. Now, interestingly, my older brother has. My older brother's bought German cars. Um, to this day, I haven't. But now I'm thinking with my new company, I may partner with a German company called MTU as my engine supplier. And even to this day, I have to think about it. So unless you have a direct personal history, generally speaking, with some sort of conflict, it doesn't matter. And I think the US showed that vividly, even back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, freshly 15, 20 years after World War II, some of the biggest selling cars were Volkswagens and Japanese cars in the United States. It's a pretty amazing thing. So the one caveat to this before I leave this slide is the only exceptions could be be careful, especially in, if, if you're a non-American company and you're dealing in a business to business situation, you better understand the background of the buyer, whoever is making the buying decision, because you may find that person may in fact have some history that you may not realize. I was going out to lunch a couple of weeks ago. A, a fellow CEO of another company, we're working on a partnering relationship. I said, hey, let's go down the street. There's a great Vietnamese restaurant. The first thing out of his mouth is, no, I won't eat Vietnamese. Now, I didn't know whether he just didn't like it. It turned out he served in Vietnam, was, was an American foot soldier. He just will not eat Vietnamese food. So be mindful of that, where you navigate and who the decision makers are, and do they have a legacy of something that could affect their decision making in business, okay? Oh, one other quick thing on this slide. Uh, Americans, we do react, but I frankly think we're short-lived on it. We, we don't have long memories even here. Um, when there's been major shortages of, uh, uh, major disruptions of labor because of products coming from overseas, I remember in the late 70s, uh, if I drove a, a Japanese car, a non-American car in Pennsylvania where steel workers were losing their job, you, you were gonna get the car keyed. You know, so Americans will react if they feel that they've suffered as a result of products that came in from other parts of the years. But frankly, it's been a long time since that's happened. More today, you'll read about this currently. You'll see more protests around wages or around worker conditions in other countries. Um, you just, if you're, if you're a company, one thing you do want to do, if you're a business buyer and you're buying from companies in Asia, you don't want to be in the headlines because you're buying from sweatshops and things like that. Again, these are things that people pay attention to. One of the most interesting uh, phenomenons in industry and doing business in the United States, um, to be successful in the United States doing business, quality is in fact a ticket to the game. Um, the definition of quality, of course, has changed dramatically over the decades. If you bought a Model T in 1915 from Mor Forward Mortar Company, you would actually get a toolbox with the car. That was the idea of quality in 1915. And you were happy that you got the toolbox with it. Today, of course, that standard is a lot different. There's a reason that I put the pictures of these cars um, with, in the years and the positions I did uh, in this slide, because the history of the automotive industry in the United States is very, very interesting as it is pertains to quality, because it was the quality element that really gave the Japanese automotive industry its first major foothold in the United States. Now, up until the 1980s, you know, Americans were driving this guy, you know, big cars. Now, in the, in the 70s, there were a lot of smaller cars that started to show up um, from especially Europe. Uh, Fiat's, uh, Fiat's had been here for quite some time. Uh, uh, there were a lot of European cars, and first Japanese cars really started showing up in mass in the 70s because of the fuel crisis. There was a fuel crisis in the early 70s in 1972. There were gas lines for the first time. All of a sudden, Americans' taste changed. We suddenly cared about fuel efficiency. Sound, sound, sound familiar compared to what happened, what, four years ago? We suddenly cared. Big cars were no good anymore. We wanted small cars. But even then, here's where quality kicked in. So the American answer to the small car, you can ask your parents about it because you all would be too young to remember it, 
We were buying Pintos and Vegas and really, really, really lousy American cars. So Detroit's answer to the small cars in the 70s were lousy small cars. And they paid a very heavy price quality-wise. Now, when the Japanese cars came over, the Datsuns and some of the other vehicles, they made a big hit because they were both fuel efficient and they didn't break down. Now, even then, it's not the same quality as standard as today. The company that really set the standard in the mid-80s was Toyota. Toyota, by the mid-80s, and by then, already a number of Japanese companies like Honda were copying their method of design and manufacturer. By the mid-80s, Toyota set a brand new standard of, standard of, of, of quality in the automotive industry, and the U.S. has been chasing it ever since, and frankly, until recent years. Probably about three, four years ago, uh, GM with its Malibu, there's some really, really good high-quality American vehicles coming out. It's taken that long to really measure up. I mean, sporadically, many cars have, but it's really taken until that many years that they've really measured up to that capability. Um, coming out of Korea, we're seeing some really fine automobiles coming out of Kia and Hyundai. Uh, outstanding cars, I'm going to talk about them again, because they're also hitting the high watermark when it comes to quality. So whether it's, frankly, um, automotive or electronics, we as a culture do have an expectation of quality. Is that a fair way to say it? One funny story before I leave this slide. Um, in 92, I was doing consulting work between my GE tenure and my Allied Signal tenure. I was a, a consultant with a firm that had a partnership with a Japanese consulting firm, and we were teaching the Toyota production system to American companies, and this was early on before American companies knew a lot about it. Our client was Ford. So we're over out in one of the Ford facilities, and Ford, of course, didn't want people to know they're learning the Toyota production system. wouldn't be good marketing for them. And one of my colleagues, I just bought a Thunderbird, that car. That was a pretty good looking car, at least in that day. He was having horrible quality experience with, Ford, with it. And Ford openly admitted the car got short changed. We're sitting there and Ford, the guys from Ford are saying, yeah, we kind of ran out of money when we were developing it and we kind of started cutting corners and yeah, we're not gonna fix the problems till the next platform comes out in two more years. Imagine if you're the buyer hearing that and the last word out of the Ford guy's mouth to my colleague was, you just made a bad buying decision. <laughs> and you imagine my buddy said, a bad buying decision? I made a bad, I mean, how would, he, how would he have known? Now, obviously, he wasn't about to buy another Ford. So, um, and it was really ironic because a bad quality decision on one platform, this was the Taurus. The Taurus actually, in the same period of time, had actually was the first American car to come out in that era that really did set a new standard for American automobile quality. And yet from the same Ford Motor Company came the Thunderbird, which was a piece of junk. So my point is, quality is something hugely important to every American consumer in pretty much every market. Probably the only exception, and all of you should be able to relate to this, is cell phones make me nuts. And the reason cell phones, I'm convinced that there's a planned obsolescence in cell phone to get me onto a new phone with another plan. Does that sound familiar? I mean, my cell phones are always kind of going bad early, and I do think there's a, there could be a willful, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, 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 a conspiracy theory guy, but I do find a lot of the new technology products, I don't think they put as much emphasis on quality because they don't need to. They feel the product's gonna turn over fast, people don't keep them that long, and for the poor son of a gun that decided to keep their t cell phone for two years after getting bashed by your buddies of why do you got that, that old cell phone, you know, they, they're, just not built, they're just not built to last, okay? Innovation and style. Um, I've got two cars here that were both produced in the 1950s this was a car out of General Motors. This was a car out of Ford. Rule number one about style. <laughs> it's like guessing clothes. Who the heck knows? The car that wasn't very popular in this audience, that is the Chevrolet Malibu that's considered, quote, the classic, one of the best looking cars ever made in American automotive history. One of the best selling cars ever. This is the Ford Edsel. 
and the Ford Edsel, Edsel was one of the biggest bombs in American history. So all of you that voted for the Edsel, you have empathy for Ford in 1956 because they thought like you did. They thought the Edsel was going to be a great selling car. Obviously some bright styling experts designed this car in 1955. They were the most renowned automotive stylists of that day. So what does that tell you about what they knew? Very subjective. It's like a piece of art, right? Some of you go see a piece of art. I think that's a fantastic piece of art. Your buddy's sitting there going, huh? Just slap some paint up there. I, I, you know, I don't get it. So styling is obviously very subjective, but it changes, it has a huge impact on perceptions. Now one of the reasons that this, these pictures are here is each one of these pictures changed how Americans thought about either a vehicle, they were game changers either because of style or innovation, or in some cases they changed how we perceived Asian companies. And up until, and you'll, I, I have a slide we'll talk about stereotypes, which is very important in how we deal with Asian companies, but we have and still do significant stereotypes in the United States about Asian, as a Asian, different Asian cultures and what they think, how they think about products. And one of the biggest um, stereotypes that existed all the way back in the 60s and still to this day in many circles is, is Asian companies aren't innovative. They don't get style, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in China, whether it's in Korea. These were products that came out of Japan in the 1960s. Sony and Panasonic in the 1960s totally changed how Americans thought about innovation. Coming out of a country that before that, by the way, we thought about everything coming out of, out of Japan as junk. There was slang when I was a kid. If you had a baseball glove in the 1960s Maine in Japan, there was a slang word that started with a J and the word that came next to it was crap. So we thought anything coming out of Asia was either toys that were crap, lousy quality, not innovative, and bang, these TVs came out. Sony had similar, and I'll, I'll show, uh, I'll show their, uh, some of their products innovation. This car totally changed Americans' perception of the Japanese automotive styling. This was the Datsun 240Z in the 1970s. It's a cool looking car, isn't it? Now, by the way, we were, we were driving this stuff. So now in context, how does that look to you? Pretty cool, right? This was a hot, I mean, somebody had a 240Z, then it came out a 260Z, then a 280Z. You had a cool car. That was game changing in how we started perceiving the Japanese automotive industry. Very, very important. And, and similarly, even of, in consumer goods, this is a Panasonic radio. This little loopy thing, really cool. In the mid 80s, Honda came out with the Prelude. I had one. It was a cool car. I, I, the first time I saw that car, what was really, it doesn't come out well in the photos, was the seats. You got in those seats and it, they just wrapped around you. It wasn't just the outside of the car, it was the inside of the car and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, right? I gotta have one. Again, the perceptions up until that point was, okay, this was kind of an aberration, but more and more vehicles came over and they looked like this and Americans started flourishing to Japanese cars, not just because of fuel efficiency, but because they looked good. They were innovative. They were packed with features. I could get a sunroof, I could get air conditioning. I had, all the, I had everything I could ever imagine in that little car. Um, some of these, uh, the Sony Walkman, game changer. Suddenly you can bring a CD player or, or a cassette tape. How many of you even have ever seen a cassette tape? <laughs> Your parents probably talk about them. Oh, my CD. Have any of you ever seen an 8-track? Probably in a museum, right? All right. I'll, I didn't have one, but I did have a cassette player. But these other products also were game changers. While, while the Japanese automotive industry was really very focused on these very, very high value impact cars, and I'll talk about that in a couple more minutes, 
American companies were coming out with also innovations. The Dodge, uh, the, the Chrysler minivan basically saved Chrysler. In the mid 80s, there were no station wagons anymore. We had come out of the fuel crisis. People were buying smaller cars for a while and people with families had no place to stick their kids. So suddenly Chrysler came out with a minivan. It changed the automotive landscape. It was a major innovation in automotive. And by the way, the SUV was too. And similarly, style and innovation, candidly, these are the first cars I've seen coming out of Korea, the Kia and the Hyundai, that so go back to my rental lot. I saw one today. I mean, every time I see a Kia and Hyundai in the rental lot, chances are I'll grab one. It's either one of the American cars or one of those. These are really neat cars. They handle well. They look good. I like driving them. Technology. This is a very interesting uh, um, uh, area when it comes to our perceptions of Japanese companies. In the United States, up until this day, we perceive most Asian companies and cultures basically as good implementers, good copiers, not very innovative. Fairly or unfairly, that's how we perceive Asian companies. Does that sound familiar? Right? And there's a reason why you see so few pictures here. Because when you look at it, you have to step back and say, OK, when it comes to technology, which companies are really known out of Asia as technology companies? Now, again, back in the 60s, Sony was. Very innovative, not just innovative, but the technology around miniaturization. I mean, Sony was a master company at figuring out how to make things smaller, put more things in them. It didn't matter what they were producing. If you saw, and eventually you saw Sony's name on something, you wanted to buy it. So again, started to change people's perception. OK, we got a Japanese company with, that's, that's, that has technology. Um, uh, tape recorders, uh, which again, you wouldn't remember. These are real to reels. Their camera industry, Nikon, Canon, the Japanese camera industry, similarly, high amount of technology. Very quickly in the 1960s and 70s, Americans were in mass buying Japanese photographic equipment. They were abandoning Kodak. They were abandoning Polaroid. Um, there was still some good stuff coming out of Europe, but by and large, people were just, if you were into photography, you were buying Japanese equipment. And then it kind of, you know, I'm sure I missed many good examples. I'm just giving some right now. Toyota really, uh, many would argue, their most innovative technology product was the Prius. I mean, it was truly fundamentally a different machine. And that many of you should be able to relate to, right? Your parents have one. They're not really good looking, are they? All I know is my kids said, Dad, when I ran my first energy or clean tech company, my two sons said, Dad, please don't buy a Prius. <laughs> of all the cars, don't buy a Prius. And I have to admit, they're great cars, but yeah, I'm, I just don't see myself in a Prius. Um, but I do think, I do think that today, you know, again, we're starting to see some very innovative things out of Korea with Samsung, their version of the smartphone. Um, very, very innovative uh, technology. Unfortunately, there's a little black eye to it because a lot of Americans, again, rightfully or wrongfully, don't know whether it really came from Samsung or this whole lawsuit that's going on with Apple, how much really came from Apple versus Samsung. People don't know, okay? Again, fairly or unfairly. The reason I put this car it caught my interest. It was a Q50. They had this commercial. It can avoid a collision because it can see it's something two cars ahead of you. That's pretty cool technology, isn't it? Now, if you care about safety, is that a product you would buy? If you could afford it, right? So, and by the way, you can see, you can see the impact in just the cell phone market of what's going on with technology. I mean, technology, this is 2013. I mean, Apple has really been dominating the cell, phone, uh, the cell phone market, but look where Samsung is coming, and they're growing. Apple's kind of holding their own. Samsung's coming on. Um, everybody else, Motorola's losing share. Nobody else. It's really a technology game. Okay, so Americans would never have guessed even five, ten years ago that Samsung would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Apple on any product that Apple had. 
So, you know, game changing stuff. Now, one of the paths now that Asian companies are coming through to try to enhance their technology, and I've been much more directly involved in this in recent years because of my world of uh, venture capital funded companies. There's a lot of companies coming in from, from China, from Korea, uh, not as much Japan because Japan ha already has a very massive R&D that goes on, but there's many Asian companies now really pushing investment through Silicon Valley. Uh, in China, they figured out how to raise private capital since you know, the government has been shifting its pri privatization policies. So they've learned a lot about raising private funds. They believe that there's an entrepreneurial ship, not just in China, but Koreans believe the same thing. In most of Asia, if you're a bright engineer or you've got a great idea, you take it to your big company, right? You're going to take it to Samsung or you're going to take it to um, uh, uh, Mitsubishi if you're in Japan. You're going to take it to your big company, right? In California, and by the way, even in the United States, Northern California is unique. I lived in Boston for a number of years and uh, when I worked for GE, and if you were an engineer, you took your ideas to AT&T, you did not take it to a VC to start a company. So there's a lot of Asian money starting to funnel its way into funding American companies and technology to eventually use either here and sell product here or use back in Asia. So I just put a few examples. There's a, number, there's a company just in energy, just in energy tech. There's a company called Greenpoint Energy. They've had a breakthrough technology in harvesting basically natural gas out of coal. One of their biggest investors beyond American VCs is uh, Wang Chang out of China. Um, who would have guessed it? Who would have guessed that uh, a number of years ago uh, that this would happen? Wang Chang has also bought a major battery, lithium ion battery company called A123, which was in bankruptcy. Um, major player in, those, in that type of product, they just purchased them. So they wanted, uh, they're a major automotive parts uh, supplier out of China, and they are trying to increase their foothold to have a better presence in electric vehicles. Um, Hanwha out of Korea, they're the number three company in the world in solar. Who would have guessed that? And they continue to invest in solar, big time. While American companies, by the way, and American venture capitalists are running for the hills on solar, uh, Asians are not. Uh, Asian corporations and Asian private equity financial firms are not running at all. They're going the other way. There's an energy deficit heading into China. If you, if you go to public forums on, um, on energy, They'll put up this big curve that says if we look at our growth and we look at our energy demands, at some point we hit an inflection bleh, where we have less energy than we have growth. It's going to stunt our growth if we can't get more efficient. I want to say it's in 2030. American venture capital firms have lost their shirts in energy technology. Um, NEA, which was the major investor in my last company that I was CEO of, had a huge, they had a billion dollar fund allocated to energy tech. That fund lost a fortune. Lost, they, 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 nothing came out of that fund yet that's made money. The biggest area that they all took a hit was solar. Solar is absolutely, you've read about solar. Solar companies in the United States have taken not just a beating, they've just been pushed out of the business. Now, all the product dumping, I mean, that's one of the things, I got some material coming up that talks a little bit about concerns about Asia in, in subsidies and things going on in China. But what happened in solar is the cost of the solar products came down far more rapidly than anybody could have ever guessed. So either it's legit, you know, I'm not a solar guy personally. I know a bit about it because many of my colleagues were CEOs of solar companies um, who I know quite well. But in their estimates, there, were so much, there was so much subsidization going on in the solar industry that they just couldn't keep up. So even though their costs were coming down, they couldn't come down fast enough and they lost their business. So the point is that American venture capital firms have lost so much of their appetite for certain parts of energy tech, they don't want to go back. But that's not universal. So for instance, my company, which I'm now raising, um, I have a round that I'm raising uh, $8 million. Um, there's a number of American firms interested. It's an energy technology product. It's more fuel efficient by 
20, 35 to 35% than the product it replaces. But it's a genset. I mean, it's a traditional looking product. It's a far different technology. It burns fossil fuel, so people don't think that's clean. Well, it burns less energy. To me, that's clean. But anyway, the point is, it's a problem because people in the United States have not been making money at it. That's the issue. And I think the other reason Asians are willing to is because of the deficit. They know they have an energy issue. And if they don't find more efficient sources of energy, their, their economies are going to come to a, a screeching halt in about 20 years. So there's an imperative to do it. And plus, I think one of the big difference in a positive way in Asian cultures versus American, uh, and I'm not saying anything that most of you, if not all of you, don't know, we tend to think far too short range. We think about business people in America think about quarter to quarter, maybe year over year. A long horizon for us is a three to five year plan. Um, most Asian cultures and companies think in terms of 10, 20 plus years, and that's why I think they're willing to invest in this. By the way, the three most interested investors in my company outside of you American firms are Chinese firms. Um, Value, getting more, getting as much as you can for what you pay for. And it's very interesting, you know, again, we'll buy products at different price points if we think we're getting value for it, right? That's a very interesting phenomenon. If you think, well, let's add this feature, I'll pay more for it. Add this feature, I'll pay more for it. The biggest foothold Asian companies, especially in the automotive industry, uh, made in the United States was over value. I mean, many significant footholds happen. Again, um, Elect consumer electronic products, again, Toyota, Honda in the mid 80s, common story. You were getting a lot of car for what you were paying. And I think, is that true still to this day? Right? I mean, when you buy a car, are you buying mostly on low cost or are you buying mostly on value? Because none of you are old enough to buy buying the $100,000 cars unless you got something coming into this thing. But most of you, I think, are buying on value, right? When you buy a car, you want to get as much as you can packed into that car. And Asian companies have done a fantastic, even on the luxury end, Lexus totally changed the world of luxury vehicles. I mean, luxury vehicles prior to the Lexus coming along were Mercedes, they were Cadillacs. By the way, if we go back to the quality part of the story, the quality part of the story was that those products just didn't hold up. They were constantly in the shop. Um, Lexus comes along, has all these high-end features, affordable price, and it never broke down. And, 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 and Americans have never looked back. Um, TVs, um, you know, the electronics industries, again, you know, lots of value. That's where the, many of the Korean companies in the last 10, 15 years have really emerged. Samsung, LG, you're getting a lot of TV, a lot of product for what you're paying, right? How many of you have a Samsung or an LG TV? Why? Get a lot for what you pay for, right? Um, so moving on to low cost. So obviously there's a big part of Asia business comes in because they are still to this day low cost for what I would call labor content or high labor content oriented products. Um, Clothes, any, anything you can think of, we buy stuff out of Asia because it's all about, in our minds, we pay people, they pay people less there so we can get it cheaper and then bring it over here. Here's the irony. How many of you guys, how many of you have studied uh, business financials, uh, spent a lot of time combing through P&Ls? Do you know what typical product companies' cost of labor is relative to the total cost of their product in a simple assembled product? it's usually below 5%. If it's 10%, that's a lot. A few industries like automotive, it may be labor as the total cost of product could be as much as 20 or 30%. But most labor is a percentage of your total, pro of your total cost of business is a relatively no low number to start with, okay? So yet we'll go buy labor uh, 12,000 miles away to save you know, so many dollars or so many cents an hour, okay? So I'm gonna come back to that when I talk about a steed strategy, because that's changing. The concept of chasing cheap labor, and this is something Asian companies need to have a heads up to that are depending on it. The challenge with buying something 12,000 miles away, you gotta forecast that 
that shirt or those pair, how many of the 33 inch waist pants of that style you're going to have in your stores six months from now. And I bet you most of us can't predict what we're going to eat for dinner in a week. I don't think most of us can predict what we're going to have for dinner two days from now. Right? So in production and trying to buy products, sourcing products 3,000, 6,000, 10,000 miles away, there's a real time lag problem. So the cost of labor is a real advantage in some ways, but think about what happens at a store if you have too much merchandise. What do the stores do? Sale, right? How much will stores mark off merchandise that they have too much of? 25, 50 percent, right? They don't bat an eye, right? And we're saving, what, 10 percent of the cost of goods on labor, maybe five? And by the way, when the store doesn't have the item you're looking for, what do, they, what do you do? Do you go to wait for that item to show up in a month or do you go somewhere else? So we'll talk about that in a few more minutes because I'm going to have to wrap up and let you ask questions in a few seconds. But this world is changing. So in certain things, low cost works. But there's an increasing, there's a world that's going to start to change because people are looking at the broader value chain and looking at the broader questions about, about where should product be sourced depending on where the markets are and the responsiveness requirements of that market. Brand power is another very significant buying behavior. We think of buying things based on a brand name, right? So again, I already talked a lot about this uh, indirectly. Um, Japan, um, we had these negative images of Japan until Sony and uh, uh, came along and Panasonic. Korea, we had the same thing. So these brand names totally changed how we think about things. In 1980, and somebody says, hey, what's your image of Apple? It's a fruit. Who would ever think the image of an apple would be innovation and technology? Cool. I mean, all those things that come with the image of an apple. So Asian companies are increasingly able to start to generate the images. And I, and I would not, and, and now, as I say, Korean companies are starting to come on. I think Samsung was one of the early ones. I mean, Japanese companies have been able to do it for quite a few years. I haven't seen, frankly, a Chinese company show up. I've seen a Taiwanese company start to show up, Acer. But you know, earning brand recognition is difficult. Here are the fears. Um, I'm just going to cover this short list. Uh, when I do business in Asia, especially because I've run large purchasing organizations, and when I was, when I was head of operations for Allied Signal Air, uh, Aircraft Engines, um, I had a multi-billion dollar buying organization. We had buyers buying stuff all over the world. I certainly didn't want to send buyers buying stuff in areas that were corrupt, from companies that were corrupt, where safety was a concern. Obviously, with the religious issues going on in many parts of Asia, that's becoming an increasing uh, with, the, with the religious conflicts going on between the different uh, ethnic groups. I mean, if I'm an American buyer, I am very, very concerned about my sources and certainty of supply. Fairly or unfairly, mostly unfairly to a company who sits in those parts of the world, not a lot they can control other than their own corruption. But corruption, by the way, um, the only thing, you're all young in your careers, it's not just in Asia you get exposed to it. And I have to give you first-hand advice on that. Early in my career, I started out, by the way, in a very high-tech business. Um, it was called scrap metal and lead smelting. Um, so if, if I seem brain dead from time to time, it was working from the time I was 13 around kettles of lead. How many of you have ever seen The Sopranos? The show The Sopranos? That stuff is real. That's all I can tell you. Because I can't tell you how many times I was approached with stolen merchandise. I could make an easy buck. But I will say, even in major companies, you can get exposed to that, whether you're the United States or Asia. And once you cross a line into corruption, you make a decision based on it, um, you're stuck. People will get you forever. So that's a little morality comment for me. But you're young, please don't find yourself in a situation because you will get exposed to it. It's just a matter, of, it's not a matter of if, you will get exposed to it, it's just a matter of when, okay? if you go into business. Certainty of supply I've talked about. My biggest concern with my company selling product in Asia, I mean, Asia should be a biggest market for my product. It's a big power generation for power, uh, big gen sets for primary power. Um, 
China should be a huge market for it. India should be a huge market for it. I am deathly afraid of selling my product in Asia. Um, I don't want to turn around in six months and find somebody else has one just like it. And I guarantee pirating is occurring. It's been occurring because you can't reverse engineer a product in less than two years. So when you're seeing products show up in six months or four months after another company introduced theirs, there's something going on under the, under the surface that is just not kosher. And it just, I think it's just a fact. I mean, anybody picks up a product and tries to reverse engineer it, you cannot do that in less than I say. Figure it out, then engineer your own version, work around patents. You cannot legitimately do that in less than two years, maybe three. So you've got to be awfully careful. And today, if somebody wants to convince me to start selling and partnering with a company, say, in, in mainland China, I have to start thinking about, okay, how am I going to protect my, my IP so I don't lose my company? And I think the more Asian companies and governments realize this, the more comfortable American companies will be. Um, and yet, you know, many companies seem to be comfortable. Hey, that's their decision, but it's certainly not a decision I'm going to be comfortable with until I'm convinced. Um, and uh, stereotypes, you know, they keep working their way into all of this. Um, so, you know, just be mindful of stereotypes, how we perceive people. I think we as a culture perceive Asians as hardworking in different, all parts of Asia. Um, we tend to think of them as very practical. Again, I'm not trying to say it's right or wrong, it's just how we think. Um, and we, again, we don't think that many parts of Asia value IP. And then the last thing I want to talk about before I close is speed. I've touched on this. Uh, I could create a whole series of lectures about speed. There is a revolution in manufacturing that's actually been going on for decades now, Oops, for about 30 years, but most, still most American companies still haven't caught on. And it doesn't matter whether you're a product business or a service business. Southwest Airlines is a speed airline, not the drug speed. It's a speed quick airline. The reason they have a speed strategy is they turn their planes on the ground faster than anybody else by far. So they focus on what's the non-value add, and the non-value add is when the plane's not flying. Companies that have, that's what Toyota bought to the United States, um, and companies have been co topping, copying Toyota, Toyota for decades. It is a profoundly important set of concepts. How many of you have ever heard of lean manufacturing or lean? It's more than just manufacturing. It's design and manufacturing. It's product creation. How many of you have heard of Lean Six Sigma? Hey, one of my claims of fame, I created the first Lean Six Sigma model in industry, so I did that. Um, and all, not because I was smart, just because my company happened to be introducing Lean. I was introducing Lean, and somebody else came in with Six Sigma, and I had a Miller-like commercial. People were battling which is better, so I had to integrate the model. But it's actually good stuff. It's very important stuff. Uh, but one of the things that's important about this, it's bringing a lot of manufacturing onshore into the United States, and this is very important for Asian companies to know. There's a reason Toyota makes cars in Georgetown, Kentucky. There's a reason that Kia has moved manufacturing into Georgia for American markets. It's all about speed. What they learned, started to learn decades ago is if you're going to serve a market, in, 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 which is your primary customer market, the only way you can respond fast enough is to have your supply chain close to where that market is. Now, granted, Toyota still brings their engines over from Japan, but most of the suppliers for their cars are outside of their, right, right, right around their Georgetown, Kentucky facility. So it's very interesting. What companies like Toyota and many, every other automotive company is moving manufacturing to the United States, there's still American companies moving manufacturing to Asia, and it's because of these two very, very 180 degree operational concepts. And again, it's a whole series of lectures for a different day of why that, how, how that works. And the last thing I want to close on is where I started. Hey, it's about listening and learning. Um, by the way, I'm going to have to share one of my pet peeves. Um, if you really want to be successful in business, whether you're uh, from Asia or the United States doing business in different parts of the, area, you, parts of the world, you've got to understand different people of different cultures. The thing that makes me nuts I live in Northern California. I go through one of the best high schools in the, in, the, in, in the United States where my kids went to school. And I go through the cafeteria and all the Asian kids are sitting here and all the Caucasian kids are here and the Indian kids are anywhere. 
And I'm sitting there going, there's as much a difference between a kid from Japan and Korea and all these different Asian cultures. They're just as different as all the Caucasian cultures, but they're sitting together because they look alike. Now, I'm a CEO. I hate that. And I'm sitting there, why would I want to hire people who only give a damn about sitting next to the person, people that look, look like them? How good is that person going to be in my company? What do you think my reaction is going to be when I see a bunch of employees sitting together because of how they look? So I think if you're really going to embrace internationalization, you have to embrace understanding what the per people and person is that comes from a different background and thinks a different way. And the more you're able to do that, the more you're able to think and work together in a very productive business way. So by the way, that's my soapbox speech of today. Expect to fail. Nobody gets it right first. And matter of fact, many people get it wrong 20 years later. I'm still getting it wrong. Hopefully, my, it's about, to me, it's a matter of batting averages. It's about hitting at least better than 500. And lastly, stay humble. The worst thing that I've ever come across in business is arrogance. And I think good business people will typically say the biggest enemy of business or anything you do in life is people that are arrogant. The people in the company that thinks they know it all is the one that's going to be dead in five years. Because they're not afraid and a good business is afraid. And what a comment I like to leave with and open up for questions is, what I always just like to say is, hey, be, be proud of where you come from, but feel damn uncomfortable where you're at because there's somebody else trying to get what you got. And I think it's a very healthy way to live. It keeps you learning. It keeps you thirsty for there's got to be a better way. And the biggest thing that gets away in that is arrogance. And I don't care what you do in your life, but that's, to me, the biggest poison that exists in, in, in our nature.